Hello everyone and welcome to the English Hour. In today's lecture or episode we have a very special topic that I think pertains to each and every one of us and it is time management. Sure. Hi guys. Well, time management is a reality for every one of us and unfortunately it is like an idealist goal that none of us can achieve. I mean, we have varying degrees of success in time management, but we can always improve. And when I talk about time management and within the context of this episode, we'll specifically talk about an important concept, which is Parkinson's law. And then we'll talk about procrastination and we will, I think, wrap up with prioritization of our duties or goals. So that's the general framework. And I guess these topics that you just mentioned will culminate in some sort of list of things that we would suggest for a more effective time management. That is true. So I think let's get started with the definition of Parkinson's law. I'm not an expert on Parkinson's law. Neither am but I. But luckily we've got Wikipedia. Yeah. Though we cannot access it at the time of this recording, uh, Uncle Google provides yeah. some snippets from search results. And based on that snippet, the Parkinson's law is defined as the adage that work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So in simple terms, it means if you have 10 days to get something done, you'll use 10 days. But if you've got five days to get the same thing done, then you'll do it in five days. So the more time you give for the completion of a project, the more time you will use. So that's basically my understanding of the term. What do you think, John? Well, you know, I'm kind of a visual thinker. So the first thing that comes to my mind when I look at this Parkinson's law and its definition is the polyurethane foam, which you use. It's a substance that you use to fill gaps in your wooden walls or like maybe the frame of a door. Like there are those little gaps in between the concrete and the wooden uh, frame of a door. You use the polyurethane foam and it foams up, it like swells up and then fills the entire gap. And it's like, I'm thinking, uh, you know, Parkinson's law, in cases where Parkinson's law applies, you're actually foaming up the amount of work that you're going to do. So it's like it becomes a more voluminous. So there is like more apparent work. Yeah. But the substance is actually the same. I think you got very technical. Yeah, so it's like, I mean, uh, I mean, that's that's well, what that I works. think of. That's how well, I visualize it. I yeah. think it will also appeal to a lot of visual thinkers if they've got somehow a technical background. Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the foam that like foam. I think foam is the actual word that I'm trying to get at. So foam by its nature is little substance, but a lot of volume. That's what foam is. So in this case, a foam is a good metaphor because the substance is the same, but its volume increases. So you're doing the same thing over a longer period of time. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Parkinson's law in real life terms. So I think uh, a lot of can, a lot of students can relate to this. For example, um, if you're a teacher or professor or instructor or I don't know research assistant, if someone uh, gives you homework or an assignment that should be completed in two weeks, then you will complete it in two weeks. You can complete it in two weeks. But and meet the deadline. Yeah. But if your instructor said, well, this is Monday and I want this assignment handed, it, handed in on Friday, you'll probably uh, complete the same assignment in about four to five days. So I think that's Parkinson's law in practice or in real life. I, that's a good example. Although I think there could be an exception to how that would work out. And the exception would be if the deadline is two weeks and you spend a total of five hours doing the assignment. And then if the deadline is just five days and you basically just take up like 
the same amount of time, just five hours, but it is spread out in five days rather than two weeks. So actually you're doing the same work within the same period of time, but the deadline is sooner. So that could be. That is true. So I think it, this also relates to the issue of deadlines. So mm -hmm. I think deadlines can be a great motivator to accomplish what you have at, at hand because like if there is a goal and this also relates to goal setting because there is a methodology smart goal setting in which each uh, each letter stands for an acronym so for That's example right. i think uh, one is one of the goals is to set goals with deadlines with time attached to it because mm. if you say well i'd like to get fit Great. Well, you can get fit at the age of 60 or you can get fit uh, before the end of the summer. So there, the goal is the same, but uh, the results radically change depending on how much time you give to yourself for that goal. So I think deadlines in that respect can really help because you have a goal. And when you have a deadline, when you have a strict time to achieve it by, then it naturally forces you to plan, organize, and execute rather than over complicated, uh, rather, rather than over complicating and thinking about it uh, in detail. Okay, so uh, your example makes me go back to the definition of Parking's Law and rethink what it actually means and its implications. So it says work expands so as to fill the time available for its completion. So basically what that means is the, it's the same amount of work, but it becomes bigger when you al allocate more time to doing it. So uh, I'm thinking maybe if we take this law to be correct, that it has truth value yeah. and it is applicable in real life, then we might conclude that every single thing that we do in normal life can be done more effectively, more efficiently, because we Definitely. have allocated a certain period of time to it. And if this law applies all the time in every situation, then we might allocate a less time period, a shorter time period, and then we can get it done in that time period. I think there is room for optimization in pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. For example, you can uh, think about speed. For example, in the, in the past, we didn't have uh, speedy cars. We didn't have speedy planes. And the amount of time it took to travel from one place to another was enormous. But right now it's much shorter. And in the future, I think it will uh, decrease dramatically. Even, uh, it'll, it'll be even shorter. And that kind of speed allows us to explore a greater portion of the universe. For example, we are right now on the face of the earth, but if we can get like enormous speed increases, we can go to a different planets, for example, like Mars. So um, we have talked about goal setting, and I think it's a good gateway to talk a little bit about prioritization, because uh, that's an sure. important part of time management. Yeah, I think, um, well, I mean, goal setting is such a complex issue. Well, if you think about it and learn about it, it can get really complex. But if you don't think about it, it's very simple. You set goals and you try to achieve them. But if you have a framework uh, through which you try to accomplish your goals, I think you can get more done. And there are great frameworks, but I think it's, it's not necessarily the number of goals that you accomplish, but it's the goals that matter. Because if you accomplish goals that matter, I think uh, you achieve a lot more in life. For example, one of the groundbreaking truths for me was the realization that there are urgent things and there are important things. But urgent doesn't mean important. So mm. if you can fit in more important things in your day compared to urgent things, I think you progress much faster. Mm, that's a that's an investment type of uh, understand like it's when you spend more time doing important things as opposed to urgent things it means that you are willing to invest in your future or in the future of whatever you're trying to accomplish and 
On the other hand, if you always prefer doing urgent things, then you're basically playing catch up. Like that you're is always true. reacting to whatever comes your way. I mean, if we are always absorbed in day-to-day -day operations, then I think it's it becomes very difficult to accomplish our vision because you and I know that we have a great vision when it comes to language learning, teaching, and the whole infrastructure of language teaching and learning. And that's a grand vision, but to accomplish that grand vision, there are goals, stages, and execution. But then if we are simply stuck with like simple, simple tasks that do not really contribute to the final goal, then I think we, we cover very little ground. I agree. Well, and that really relates to prioritization. That, yeah. I agree. So prioritization basically means deciding what is important and focusing on that at the expense of less important or less significant tasks. Can yeah. you do you agree with this definition? I basically definitely, I definitely agree because um, at a given time I think we all have a lot on our plate more than we can chew or handle. But then since you know that you can't handle everything at the same time you have to have priorities you have to select a few that you can accomplish maybe just one mm -hmm. and for example in a business environment uh, we have a lot of opportunities because there are a lot of projects that we can focus on there are a lot of uh, opportunities but if if we try to sort of uh, do everything at the same time we end up doing little or nothing because you know it's I think this well I'm I'm not sure if I'm a visual type of learner I am and I'm not but this really sparked images of sunlight going through a magnifier mm -hmm. and focusing on a certain spot That's and if right. you can uh, sort of focus sunlight in a certain spot I think it'll uh, trigger a fire or something that's right. You're talking about increased pressure, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the same, the, it, it goes with, bl you know, blades, for example, knives. If they are blunt, if the, you know, the uh, intersection, the, uh, the cross section of the blade or the knife is too thick, you're not going to achieve anything with that blade or that knife because you're not going to be able to cut. But if it is very thin, then the increased pressure will cut anything you put the knife to. So I agree that pressure in this case and focus in our case, in the case of time management, is an important factor, an important parameter. And I think this also goes back to prioritization because prioritization yes. is a way of focusing your attention. So you're choosing to focus on something and not another thing. And that is a very personal, individual thing. It's almost like focusing a camera, like if you choose, if you pick up a camera and you turn it over to a person of importance to you. You're not really speaking to my emotions. <laughs> As a, um, a newly uh, minted uh, photo photography enthusiast, you know that focus is all important. It's yeah, the it essential uh, feature of any successful it's photograph. It's the reason why we, why we buy pricey lenses. That's right, I agree. And also pricey camera camera bodies too, because camera bodies affect That's out of focus true. as well. So you and given the current exchange rates, <laughs> that is terrible stuff. It yeah. sucks, really. I agree. So it's the same thing basically. You choose to focus on something and not on another thing, which means that the first thing gets your attention and the second thing does not. But there's a very good reason because you realize that that is what is important for you at the present time in the present set of circumstances. So that's prioritization. That is acceptance of the reality that you're not going to be able to do everything. I agree. And I was about to say the same thing. And it really, I mean, goal setting and accomplishing your goals really starts with the realization that you are a mortal human being. You cannot do everything at the same time. And there are always trade-offs. But it's important to know what kind of trade-offs to make. So you should know what matters to you and you should um, 
choose your trade-offs based on on your priorities or on your values because for example I mean your business your family your personal life your hobbies and I mean when you talk about business there are a lot of projects that can matter to you and and you might like all of those projects but the thing is you're probably not going to be able to do all of those at the same time and and that brings out the harsh reality you'll have to choose one focus on it execute it accomplish it and then with with the confidence that you gain from that one big goal you can go out and knock out the others i totally agree and that's a beautiful way to phrase it too i'm going to introduce a term that we did not talk about before starting this podcast which is flexibility because i think it's important and i'm going to give you an example as to why there are typically two ways of writing non-fiction and one is journalistic style of writing and the other is academic style of writing you've already heard of both of them and and their comparisons so these two groups academics and journalists are polar opposites in terms of how they write what they write for and their level of urgency and importance so i think they present a good example get a good case in point in in time management if you're a journalist you write very short pieces short stories you write very quickly and you always have shorter deadlines than you can manage if you're an academic you all you also have deadlines but they're much longer and they're more manageable because you focus on quality rather than quantity most of the time you're not supposed to write 300 words and push it through an editor in 15 minutes you have 15 days to write maybe a thousand words maybe 500 words well, but abstract first yeah abstract first and you're gonna have to do a much better job there if you focus your energy however i've got to introduce something so this might well, if you work in academia, you already know this, but for most students, this is a surprise. So the time between us trying to write a paper and publishing it in a journal can take up to a whole year. So exactly. you write the first draft, you send it to reviewers in a peer-reviewed journal, and then you get uh, feedback, you work on it and send it back and then you get feedback again it takes months exactly and in journalism you never have that type of chance you can't survive as a journalist if you write that way or if the editors have to um, send it back to you every time they want something to be changed so and i think this is important uh, to understand both of these poles these polar opposites and the good mixture in between the best of both worlds and here's my premise if you want to be a successful journalist for example you will eventually be required to write longer pieces and what I mean by that is first of all features you can always write beat stories meaning stories about things that are happening during the daily normal course of life yeah and but you have to write about human interest stories for example you have to go out talk to people and write maybe thousands of words on their lives on their aspirations on their dreams hopes and you can talk about a specific type of person for example you're going to devote more uh, like longer pieces to that type of writing and even longer if you want to be remembered as a journalist maybe you're going to write a book and uh, writing a book is a much longer process it is and that requires flexibility because if you are always attached to your keyboard and if you're always writing 300 words per story and pushing it out in half an hour maybe even shorter time then you're not going to be able to focus your attention on a whole different task yeah you'll have to resist the temptation to I write totally up quickly agree. and cut it short exact quick and dirty you yeah. can't do it quick and dirty that time you have to adopt a more academic style of writing which is more thoughtful more deliberate and at the same time it takes a longer process to complete 
So, and it goes for the academic as well. They have to show some flexibility as well, because if you want to be a successful academic, you're going to share your work with the largest group of people possible, both nationally and internationally. And that might mean you going to a seminar abroad where yeah. you're going to maybe deliver a very short presentation. And if you know your material really, really well, if you have like internalized it, you're going to be able to summarize it. But it's not something that every academic that I've seen in my life is capable of doing. It doesn't come very easily to people. You have sure. to work on it. For example, you is a good example of that. Like, I'm not trying to compliment you here, but it's... I I'm totally, all ears. But it's like, it's really hard to summarize. Summarization is one of the, I think, most difficult cognitive tasks. So... If you're able to do it really well, that means that you have prioritized about the content of the work that you have done. Like, you know that what you have written and you know which parts of it are important so that you can very easily decide which parts of that writing makes it to the summary. So I think it really also relates to learning and teaching because, for example, you know, different age levels or different backgrounds understand, understand things differently. So, That's for example, right. what you teach to, a, to an eight-year-old kid and what you teach to a college student are different. Totally. And I see the examples of this situation in real life a lot. For example, uh, this afternoon I had a class with a college student and though he attends a private college and pays a hefty prep class fee. He was not happy with the uh, with the grammar lessons he received, and he seemed very confused. Hmm. And I see this all the time because it's really about prioritization. Because in class, if you're an experienced teacher, you know what to teach and what not to teach. Hmm. You know what to talk about and what not to talk about. Because, for example, if you're trying to teach everything at the same time, it becomes very confusing for the student. But if you can build on top of what you taught before, then you will deliver. For example, you can start with very simple concepts, with very simple examples. Make sure that the student uh, grasps that concept, that example, that rule, and then uh, you make him practice or ma you make her practice, and then you build on top of that. And if you go that way, the student will eventually uh, get the grasp of that idea or concept. So the student uh, that I tutored this uh, afternoon suffered from that problem. So the instructor gave all the material all at once and mm. like, for example, the passive structure, mm -hmm. you know, active and passive sentences. Yeah. So he was given all the information all at once without a clear structure and progression and he was confused. Then he came and I already knew the problem before he uttered a word because mm -hmm. that's a very common problem with mm -hmm. prep students. So we started with some very, very basic elementary examples. We first talked about what is an active sentence, what is a passive sentence in Turkish and in English, how you can separate those. Because if you don't know the concepts, you cannot really differentiate between them. So that's right. First starting with the concept in very simple terms, prioritizing it, and then starting with very simple examples and with very simple tense structures, just getting things right, like uh, laying the foundation. And then uh, we built on top of that with slightly more complex examples. And by the end of, by the, end of the class, it was like, oh, this is a ridiculously simple. I'm like, yes, it is. And he's like, okay, okay, but we went over this topic for days in class and I couldn't make sense of that. I'm like, okay, I know what happened. So you need prioritization. You need sometimes summarization. You need that um, kind of goal setting. So mm -hmm. teaching can also be a form of goal setting. So for example, when I'm teaching, the first goal is to make sure that the basic concepts are in order. Mm -hmm. And then the ultimate goal is to uh, get to the ultimate or the more complex subjects. But I think teaching can be seen as a form of goal setting on the part of the teacher. If you know what you're doing, 
Exactly. I totally agree. I mean, I don't have experience myself, a lot of experience with teaching, not, not a lot. But uh, I understand where you're coming from. And the way you explained teaching was actually a lesson in itself. Like you, the, the way you structured is an example of prioritization. So I think this goes back to the importance of time management and prioritization because it's so essential to everything we do. It Even is. the way we speak, we want to talk about the most important things first or we want to have the kind of structure that allows us to talk about the most important thing. It doesn't have to come the fir like first every time, but we want to build up to something or just say it up front yeah. and be very clear about it so that it gets communicated so that we can work off of that because that's how communication works. So uh, to wrap up, I think uh, we, can, um, we can say that time management is one of the most important skills and I think it's, an, it's a form of art. It is. Uh, the most important, one of the most important skills that a human being can achieve in life and the, the earlier you're able to get it down, the better your chances of success in every field, every walk of life that you're going to touch. Yeah. And to achieve that, uh, our one of our suggestions is to prioritize. And that ties to Parkinson's law in the sense that since work expands to fill the time that you, that you have allocated to complete that work, you can always make better use of that time. And one of the ways to do that is to cut out the slack. And put deadlines. Put deadlines, exactly. To Personal limit, deadlines. Exactly. At least. Your life is limited. So how can any project have unlimited oh time? Oh my God. Like this really brought a grand vision right now. Because when you talk about your life, like we talk about time management, right? That's right. I think... In this case, when you talk about your life and it being limited, I'm like, oh my God, the biggest time management project you have at hand is managing your life. Exactly. Like totally. 60, 70, 80 years or even less. Who knows? It comes full circle. Yeah. I totally agree. So, so it's very striking. It so is when striking. When you talk about it, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> like the whole thing that we call life is a project in time management. Yeah, it's an exercise in time management and procrastination, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. That's another thing that we haven't uh, talked about a lot, but that, you know, is very close. So that's basically it. Yeah. Prioritize and make sure that you put the most important thing first. And I think it is also wise to, you know, from time to time, uh, take a look at what you judge by. It's because you can think you, you can think to yourself that something is very important at that time, but you might be confusing urgency with importance. I think another thing that really matters, uh, it's very simple, but take out a piece of paper. It can be a notepad, it can be a digital uh, notebook or anything, and dump everything that is on your mind to that piece of paper or to that digital app. Just so write that, down everything. Yeah, just write down everything so that your mind will be clear. Hmm. Just write down everything. So when you have everything that you would like to accomplish in front of you, mm -hmm. then you can prioritize them. Maybe you've got like 20 items, 30 items. Just write them down and then prioritize. Put them into buckets mm -hmm. like um, urgent, important, later, and so on. So yeah, Almost like it, mind mapping. Yeah. yeah, it can really help because it can clear your mind and it can give you a structure. So you can uh, work with those items when you have everything just in front of you. Yeah, rather than everything being up in your mind, floating around, it's you can put taxing. them down yeah, and they can become more stable and easier to remember and easier to structure. That is true. I agree. That's a very practical, you know, piece of advice I mean I think there's a lot to talk about this topic mm -hmm. but right now I think we've um, we've said enough yep. uh, we've touched on a lot of important concepts and practical examples and I think um, um, this has been a very useful episode for myself personally I've enjoyed it greatly yeah uh, the same here so I hope everyone and you the listener uh, enjoy it as well and we'll see you in the next episode. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.